Hello, my name is Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're going to be doing unit number 10, lesson number 1, on power functions. So, we're starting a new unit on polynomial and rational functions. And we're going to start by looking at one of the simplest type of functions in all of mathematics, one that's known as a power function. And we all know how we categorize functions by shared characteristics. Well, power functions are no different. So let's jump right into it and see what a power function looks like. All right. A power function is any function that's a monomial, ax to the b, where a and b are real numbers. All right. So it's very, very important. A is a real number, B is a real number, but they can be any type of a real number. So for instance, we could have something simple like f of x equals 5x squared, right, which we graph out as a parabola. We could have something like g of x equals 1 half times x to the seventh, nothing wrong with A being a rational number instead of an integer. We could have y equals 3.57 times x to the minus 2. Again, though, those values of A and B can be negative, they can be positive, they can be integers, they can be rational numbers. We could have a mixture, y equals 1 tenth x to the 1 half. Now I'm hoping, when you look at these last two, that you're keeping in mind that negative numbers indicate division and fractional exponents indicate roots, right? So all of these are power functions, and that's important to understand. Power function is very simple. It, uh, it has only one term, so this is not a power function. That would not be a power function because it's got the x squared term and the 3x term, so not a power function. But all of these are. All right. So let's jump in a little bit and work with a problem where we've got four power functions that we're going to play around with. All right, exercise number one. For each of the following power functions, state the value of a and b by writing the equation in the form y equals a times x to the b. Now please note that I didn't give you any problems like y equals 5x squared because then a would be equal to 5 and b would be equal to 2. I mean, it's sitting there and it's sitting there. There's really, there's really not much of a challenge there. Um, so I gave you ones that are a little bit more difficult. Now, right now, exercise a, number one, letter a, is not written as a number times x raised to a number. It's written as a number divided by x to a number. And yet, we should know that this is the same as 3 times 1 divided by x squared, and that that's the same as 3 times x to the minus 2. Now it's written as a power function, and we can say, well, a is 3 and b is negative 2. Right? These are the values of a and b in our power functions. So why don't you see if you can do that for letters b, c, and d? Pause the video now and see what you can do. All right. Well, it's not too bad. Again, kind of doing this type of manipulation. We can rewrite letter B as 1 7th times 1 divided by x cubed, which would be the same as 1 7th times x to the minus 3. And therefore, let me get rid of this right now. And therefore, we can say that A is 1 7th and B is negative 3. Now letter C, we don't really have to do much at all. We can rewrite this as 8 times x to the 1 half and then it's written in its power form. So a is equal to 8, and b is equal to 1 half. Letter d, maybe the trickiest of them all, right? If I sort of play the game I did in a and b, I could rewrite it like that, which then could be rewritten this way, whew, which finally could be rewritten this way. There we have it in its power form. A is equal to 6. B is equal to negative 1 third. All right. There are a lot of times when we're going to be able to want to take um, terms or functions like this and write them in their power form. Some number times x raised to some exponent. So it's good to get some practice on it here. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to.
OK. Let's clear out that text. And let's talk a little bit about power functions and the way they behave. Now, the value of a in a power function, this value, it's important. Obviously, it has some things to do with, with the geometry of what's going on and whatnot. But probably more important, much more important, is the value of the exponent. All right? So let's take a look at these two problems. It says, consider the general power function y equals ax to the b. All right. Letter A says, what can be said about the y-intercept of any power function if b is greater than 0? So don't worry about A. Just, you know, if b is greater than 0, what's true about the y-intercept of the power function? Think about this a little bit. Play around with examples. All right. Well, well, let's, let's play around with one. Um, since a really doesn't matter, you could choose almost anything for a. Let me choose a as 5, and it just says b has to be greater than 0, so maybe let's do this. Well, to figure out the y-intercept, right, we're going to take x, set it equal to 0, and we're going to substitute it in. Well, and then we'd have 5 times 0 to the third, which would be 5 times 0, which would be 0. Hmm. Maybe that's always the case. I don't know. Let's, let's try another one. Let's try, let's get tricky here. Let's try y equals negative 3 times, oh, I'm going to go crazy, x to the 1 half. All right, again, I'm going I'm to put the x equals 0 in, so we'll have negative 3 times 0 to the 1 half. Now, what do we do with, oh, right, the 1 half is the same as the square root, right? Well, the square root of 0 is 0, so we get 0 again. So what it looks like, and what is definitely true, is that the y-intercept of any power function is equal to zero as long as the power is a positive number. Now letter B, of course, asks pretty much the obvious. What can be said about the y-intercept of any power function when B is less than zero? Then it says to illustrate. So again, pause the video now and play around with this. All right, well, yeah, I don't know. Let's take a look. Um, let's again, hey, why not? Let's do uh, 5 times x to the minus 2. Let's take x equals 0 and let's plug it in. So what would we have? We'd have y equals 5 times 0 to the minus 2. Well, what does that mean? That means we have 1 divided by 0 squared. So that's going to be 5 times 1 divided by 0, but this does not exist. So no y intercept. And that's going to be generally true. Anytime we have a power function where the power is negative, there's going to be no y intercept because a negative power indicates division. And since the y intercept always occurs for an x value of 0, and since we can't divide by 0, a power function where the, the exponent is negative will fail to have a y-intercept. So it's kind of cool. You know, really, almost all power functions kind of fall into these two categories. Either the power is greater than zero or the power is less than zero. When the power is greater than zero, well, then we always pass through the origin. All right, and that's really what this means, right? I mean, it ends up having the point zero, zero. On the other hand, if the power is negative, we get 0, comma, does not exist, right? So no y-intercept at all. All right. Pause the video now, and then we'll move on to some easy power functions. Okay, let's do it. All right. So, you know, all power functions are important. But what we want to do for the rest of this lesson is investigate ones where the powers are nice whole numbers. So we're going to look at very simple power functions, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth. All right. And what I want to do is I want to fill in what each one of these power functions or expressions, however you want to look at it, is equal to just for these, these what is it, seven inputs, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video now and fill this in. And what you may want to do is you may want to just take your calculator and in y1 put in x squared. In y2 you could put in x cubed. In y3 you could put in x to the fourth. And in y4 you could put in x to the fifth. Oh, that's a bit confusing. 
All right, and then you can pop into your table and fill this in. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Pause the video now and take a little bit of time. All right, well, let's do it. If we looked at a table, what we'd see is the following. Now notice what's going on here. It doesn't seem to matter whether the inputs are negative or positive, the outputs turn out to be the same. Do you remember what those are called? Those are called even functions. This is an even power function. On the other hand, for x cubed, we get the following. And notice that, right? There's your y-intercept again. Now for y equals x cubed, notice that opposite inputs are giving us opposite outputs. So for negative 2, we get negative 8. And for positive 2, we get positive 8. For negative 3, we get negative 27. For positive 3, we get positive 27. That is an odd function. Remember odd and even functions? Now, once we get to x to the fourth, got to think about this a little bit more. But we end up having 81 here. We end up having 16, 1, 0, 1, 16, and 81. And look at that, it ends up being an even function again, right? Didn't matter whether our inputs were negative or positive, our outputs remained the same. So negative 2 gave us 16, positive 2 gave us 16. Negative 3 gave us 81, positive 3 gave us 81. And then for x to the fifth, we're right back to that odd behavior, negative 243 negative 32, negative 1, 0, 1, 32, and 243. And that's our odd function. In fact, when we talk about even and odd functions, this is why we've, we call them even and odd, is because power functions with an even exponent are even functions, and power functions with odd exponents are odd functions. All right? So, Pause the video now and think about that a little bit. Okay, let's clear out the text and let's investigate these power functions, these common ones, from a graphical perspective. All right, exercise four. Using your calculators, sketch the power functions below using the standard viewing window. That's that negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10 window. Now, if you already put those into your calculator, then you might already be ready to go on this. So what I'd like you to do is pause, pause the video now, spend a little bit of time and sketch each one of these. And I, you may even want to put them each in separately so that you, you really know which one's which. Okay, but pause the video now and go ahead and do that. All right. Well, x squared should be no great surprise, right? The standard parabola we've seen a million times, even if we can't seem to draw it. It kind of looks like that. x cubed looks something like that. Each one of these should go through the origin, no matter how badly I seem to draw it. x to the fourth looks a lot like x squared, but it's, it's a little bit flatter at its turning point. And then x to the fifth looks a lot like x cubed, except it's a lot sort of steeper, if you will. All right. Now notice again this odd even business. Whoops. Even, odd, even, and odd. And remember the idea was that when we had an even function, it would be symmetric across the y-axis. And when we had an odd function, it would be symmetric across the origin. In other words, you could rotate it 180 degrees and it would fall on itself. Perhaps even more important, though, is that when we have an even function, the ends point in the same direction. But when we have an odd function, the ends point in opposite directions. And that is amazingly important for the work that we're going to be doing in the next few lessons. So really take a little bit of time to process that. All right, I'm going to clear this out. Let's take a look at a multiple choice question to see how much you understand this. Exercise number five says, which of the following power functions is shown in the graph below? Explain your choice. Do without the use of your calculator, and I'd really highly, highly suggest that you're doing this without your calculator. So think about this for a little bit. All right, well, First things first, note 
that the two ends point in the same direction. And because of that, whatever power function this is must be an even one. So that means this one's out and this one's out. So we're now down to choice three and choice two. But notice that in all of those ones that we did in exercise number four, you know, we kept getting these power functions that opened vertically or sort of opened upwards, sorry, right? So why would one open downward? Well, that has to do with the A, right? What the A does in Y equals AX to the B is it stretches and compresses the function. Remember that, remember that, the vertical dilation. But it can also reflect a function across the X axis. And because this function has been reflected across the X axis, A must be less than zero which is why this has to be choice two, okay? And that's exceptionally important, right? Because the two ends point in the same, same direction, it's gotta be an even power function. And because they point downward, the A has to be negative. All right, we'll pause the video now and think about that a little bit. Okay, clear this out. And then we're going to do one last thing that's kind of calculator intensive. And this is really important for the lessons that are coming up. All right. We're going to look at what's called the end behavior of polynomials. Now, what a polynomial really is, and we'll investigate this more in the next lesson, is it's stringing together a bunch of power functions. Each one of these first three would be considered power functions. And what I really want to do in this lesson is, or in this probably in this problem, is I want to see what's going on with this cubic polynomial versus this power function. And note that what's important here is this is an x cubed and this is an x cubed. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually bring out the TI-84 plus now and we're going to graph these two functions together and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be graphing them in larger and larger windows, okay, in order to explore what's called the end behavior of polynomials, also known as the long run behavior of polynomials. So let's bring out that TI-84+. It's not very loud. Anyhow, let's do it. We're going to put these two functions in Y1 and Y2 just like that. So let's do it. Let's hit Y equals. If you have any equations in there right now, go ahead and clear them out. Okay. Now in Y1, let's put in that cubic polynomial. This is going to take a little bit, both for me and you, because it's, it's fairly lengthy, but let's put in X to the third. Make sure to get out of that exponent. Minus 2X squared minus 29X plus 30. All right, it's very important that this one is completely correct, so let's take a look at it. x cubed minus 2x squared minus 29x plus 30. All right, looks good. Now let's put in the much simpler one in y2. Let's put in x to the third, x cubed. All right, but check it, okay, looks good. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna graph these two in three different windows. Um, I'm sorry, four different windows. And keep in mind that the first one graphed will be the more complicated cubic, and the second one graphed will be the much, much, much simpler cubic, which is technically a power function. So let's go into our window. All right, let's put in x min is negative 10, x max is positive 10, y min is negative 100, and y max is positive 100. All right, so there we have it. No big deal. Um, make sure that your window is all correct. Um, this is a fairly sizable window, especially in the y direction, but it's not huge. Now, we had to make it pretty big because, quite frankly, you know, 10 squared is 100, 10 cubed is 1,000, so, you know, we're, we're already getting pretty big. But let's hit the graph button. Takes a little bit. Right, the first one to come up again in blue is the uh, more complicated cubic function. And the second one coming up in red is the power function y equals x cubed.
And what we see is we see a definitive difference here, right? I mean, on the more complicated one, we see these two beautiful turning points, right? It, it's, it's a very kind of rich cubic function. The second one, um, not as interesting, right? It, it's just that standard uh, power function, odd, you know, the two tails are pointing, or the two ends are pointing in different directions. But these are two very, very distinctly different functions. But now, now let's change the window a little bit. Let's make it larger because what we really want to do is see what's happening and how these functions behave in the long run, i.e. when x gets very large, either negative or positive. So let's pop back into our window right now. No need to do anything in terms of our functions themselves. For our x min, let's put in negative 20. And for our x max, let's put in positive 20. All right, now for y min, all I want to do is add an extra zero, so that should be pretty easy. And for our y max, I just want to add an extra zero. Now again, the, the x window doubled, it got bigger, and the, the y window increased by a factor of 10. You know, it got considerably bigger, but we, we really have to do that when we make our x even just a little bit bigger with a cubic. But make sure that your window looks good, negative 20 to 20, negative 1,000 to 1,000, and now let's hit that graph button again. Just like before, right, the more complicated cubic is going to end up graphing in blue. And the much less complicated cubic is going to end up graphing in red. All right. And what we notice is that we can still most certainly see a difference between these two. But the turning points are less pronounced on that more complicated cubic. And they're starting to look a lot more similar. So as sort of the range over which we're graphing these things increases, right? They're looking more like each other. All right. Let's take a look in these next two windows. Let's, let's take a look when we make that window a little bit bigger. So let's pop back into the window. Okay. For x minimum, let's put in negative 50. For x maximum, let's put in positive 50. Okay. Sorry, I'm moving kind of quick. For y minimum, again, we're going we're gonna to add an extra zero, so we're now going to be at negative 10,000 for our y minimum, negative 10,000. And for our maximum, again, we're just going to add a zero. So our maximum y value is now going to be a positive 10,000, positive 10,000. All right, so make sure you've got your window right, negative 50 to 50 in x, negative 10,000 to 10,000 in y. That seems like a monstrous window, but we need it that big. And now let's hit graph again. All right, the blue one is graphing out. And as soon as it's done graphing, then comes the red. All right. And what we definitely see in this particular window is that these two functions almost, almost look identical. Do they look identical? No, but they almost look identical, right? And what we're definitely seeing is that we're seeing the same end behavior, i.e. that more complicated cubic, even though it's got turning points, its ends are pointing in the opposite directions, just like the simpler one. So let's take a look at that last window. Let's make it really, really big. Let's pop back into our, our window. And let's make our x min be negative 100. And we'll make our x max be positive 100. All right, so we're now doubling the size of the window. Y min now is a whopping negative 100,000. We're just going to add another zero to that negative 10,000, negative 100,000. And our y max is a positive 100,000. Okay, so. Get those in there, then take a good look at the window, negative 100 to 100 in the x direction, negative 100,000 to 100,000 in the y direction. And now let's hit graph. And the amazing thing is these graph, right, as the blue gets graphed out, and then the red starts graphing, is that the red appears to lie entirely on top of the blue. You know, it basically appears like I just graphed the exact same function. So what we're really seeing is as x gets larger, 
the end behavior acts exactly the same. All right. And by the way, when I say when x gets larger, I mean both positive and negative. All right. Now, why does that occur? All right. This can be very, very tricky for kids. And it occurs because as x gets larger, the x cubed term in y1 does what's called dominates, i.e. it becomes much larger than all other terms. Right? So, you know, when x is 10, you know, x cubed versus x squared, well, there's definitely a difference, but, you know, the x squared still matters. You know, and we're talking like, you know, when x is 10, x cubed is 1,000, x squared is 100. You know, so, I mean, x squared is still one-tenth of x cubed. On the other hand, by the time x is 100, you know, then when you cube it, you're getting a million. 100 cubed is a million. If you think about it really hard, you can probably figure out that, that out. But 100 squared is only 10,000. And again, 10,000 is, is big. But compared to a million, it's, it's not really all that big at all. All right? So the most important thing, really, that you need to take out of here is that the long run or the end behavior of any polynomial is going to be dictated by its highest term. Yeah, there's going to be turning points and things like that, but ultimately the direction in which its ends point is all dictated by the highest powered term. All right, so pause the video now and sort of absorb that a little bit. Okay. I'm going to clear out the text, and then I think we'll let our TI-84 calculator go away, and let's wrap up this lesson. All right, so today you were introduced to a new type of function, a power function, y equals a times x to the b. We saw how that power function's behavior, especially with y-intercepts, depends on whether or not the power is positive or negative. And then we also finally got a glimpse at why we call functions even versus odd, right? Um, and very, very important to understand that power functions that have an even exponent have ends that point in the same direction, and power functions that have an odd exponent have ends that point in opposite directions. The final thing that we looked at was this idea that once we have a polynomial, which is sort of a, a bunch of power functions added or subtracted together, its long-run behavior, in other words, the direction that its ends point in, will always be dictated by the highest powered term. All right, that was a lot, a lot in there. All right, I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.